Good afternoon and welcome to today's Made by McGill alumni webcast, Are Intelligent Machines Making Us Dumber? My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement, and it's Wednesday, June 28, 2023. As technology advances at an unprecedented pace, we find ourselves at the forefront of a new era where the boundaries between human and machine are blurring. The rise of AI and generative language tools has brought about remarkable advancements in various domains. These technologies have proven invaluable in areas like natural language processing, data analysis, and even creative endeavors. They possess the ability to assist us, augment our capabilities, and unlock new possibilities that were once unimaginable. However, as with any powerful tool, there are inherent risks and challenges that demand our attention. Today, we will explore the darker side of this technological revolution and examine the perils that arise when these technologies are not approached with caution or when they fall into the wrong hands. Now, let me just stop for a minute. If you had any doubt as to whether AI-powered language tools are effective, consider this. That introduction I just read out was written entirely by a machine. I went into my free ChatGPT account and asked it to prepare an opening statement for this panel, and the software spit out those words in a matter of seconds. So clearly, we have a lot to discuss with our esteemed panelists today. So let me introduce them, this time in my own words, honest. We have with us today Andrew Piper, who is a professor and William Dawson Scholar of Cultural Analytics in McGill's Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, and Derek Ruths, who is an associate professor in McGill's School of Computer Science. Both have spent most of their academic careers studying the power of artificial intelligence tools and trying to understand their impact on society. Before we get started, a note that if you're watching us live, and if you or your chatbot has a question for our panel, you can email us at aoc at mcgill.ca. I'll do my best to address them to our guests. So let's get started. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, Professor Ruth, maybe I'll start with you. For those of us less familiar with AI-powered generative language tools like ChatGPT, can you explain to us how this technology works? Sure, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be chatting about, about this. Uh, it seems a, a, prescient, a prescient topic to be, to be covering at this moment. Um, so when we think about something like ChatGPT, I think uh, when we talk, talk about generative AI, right now, I think the ones that are the most visible to the public are uh, chat uh, generation, text generation tools, and image generation tools. Um, and it's useful to, to sort of separate those two out. Um, at the, and so ChatGPT belongs to uh, the text generation uh, type artificial intelligence. And I think that's one where uh, our human intuitions work best for understanding the way this kind of machinery works. Um, so what these, what something like ChatGPT does in order to do the kind of amazing compositions that you just demonstrated <laughs> is it performs actually a much, much simpler task, which is it tries to guess the next word that comes after the word that it has just been exposed to. Um, and, and so it's, what it's done is it's been exposed to effectively the majority of text on the internet, um, and it has learned patterns for how text, how words follow others. Um, and so we can actually kind of experience this, the way this works, simply by sort of doing a little mental experiment. So imagine that I start a phrase, happy birthday to, and then fill in the blank. Most of us would answer you because it's an established pattern. That's a pattern that we have in language. Um, if I say once upon a, well, we're gonna fill in whatever that blank is, but most of us are gonna know to fill that in with time. Now, if I continue that and I say, once upon a time there was a blank and I ask you to fill that in, we might start coming up with different answers. Some of us might have dragons or princes or princesses <laughs> or adventurers. But the, the, the most important point is that we've learned patterns that allow us to choose a sensible thing to put next. And so when we look at something like generative AI, like ChatGPT, what it's really doing is it's really just doing that over and over and over and over and over again. And so that passage that you read at the very beginning was effectively generated word by word by word by word. You prompted and said, I would like the opening to... A, sec a session on artificial intelligence. And from that prompt, it asked the question, all right, well, what's the first word that comes? And then what word would follow this? And what word would follow this? It, which seems like an astounding capability for it to have. And it truly is quite astounding. 
Um, but when we think about these large language models, which is what they're called, we have to remember that they have been exposed to effectively all the language patterns that we have generated and put on the internet since its inception. So it has ad had access to a tremendous number of patterns that are out there, and it's just mm -hmm. leveraging those in order to complete uh, text. Right. And I guess the key is that sort of predictive piece. So it's sort of predicting what one in this situation would say as a next word or give as a, as a potential answer uh, and obviously processing reams of information that a human brain could never imagine to be able to do on its own. I mean, yes and no. I think what's quite interesting, so two things to pick up there is there's the predictive element and there's some debate about exactly whether it's predicting or whether it's simply mimicking. Because mm -hmm. if I show, you know, happy birthday to finishing that with you, I think we would I think we would fairly say that's not real prediction. That's just repeating something that you've heard a lot of times. And mm -hmm. so there is a lot of cases. There are a lot of cases where ChatGPT produces content that looks either identical or very similar to things that it has seen before. So it's not clear that everything that it's producing is really predictive. It may actually be more about it recalling content. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's hold that thought because we're going to get into that as part of our discussion about prediction versus copying and, and copying mm -hmm. and pasting and, and all the implications of that. But let me bring in Professor Piper on this. So I imagine during the course of our, our conversation today, we'll be spending quite a bit of time focusing on what some would call the darker side of artificial intelligence. But before we jump into that, maybe uh, I can ask you to speak about some of the advances we've seen in the AI field and machine learning in the past, in the past few years. And maybe you can share a couple of examples of how society and, and humankind are, are benefiting from this incredible technology. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and also, yeah, thanks for, for having me today. It's nice to talk with you about this topic. Um, I, you know, I think it, when we're talking about uh, the large language model AIs that, that we're engaging with now that are capturing people's attention, I think there's a lot of uh, up in the air aspect to it, a lot of uncertainty about the future. I mean, we'll talk about the, the risks and dangers associated with them and also the opportunities. But I, I mean, I always find it really important to emphasize the uncertainty behind them. In other words, I think when we talk about a sort of more classic machine learning AI approaches in the past, we're for medical applications and things like that. We've, you know, we've heard stories about how AIs are getting about as good as, as certain doctors in, in detecting um, anomalies and imagery around human health and things like that. And, and those are real applications and those are gonna be real advances that are gonna improve people's health. Uh, I think when we're in the AI space and the language space, it's really unclear what the the, the advantages and affordances of this are. Um, one area that I think people are pretty excited about and really exploring is the education space. And so, and I don't just mean here, like we'll get into the details of how it's impacted me and my students uh, already this past semester. Um, but just in general, if you think about uh, the ability of an an intelligent agent to walk you through a problem it is a big deal, right? So, so I think where people are starting to get excited and, and see potential applications for something like this is, you know, imagining personalized tutors. Um, it, you know, education is an enormously expensive, enormously important social undertaking. Um, we have by no means solved it as a society. Uh, and so the, the fact that we might have interactive agents that can kind of walk you through a problem in a more personal way that I think there's people really kind of thinking, oh, that that could be a bit of a game changer in terms of accessibility to education. It comes with all sorts of caveats in terms of accuracy, fidelity to the facts. And when we know AIs have this hallucination problem where they're very comfortable making things up because they don't have a grounded sense of the truth or they don't have intrinsic moral codes. Um, on the other hand, I mean, an anecdote I'll give you is I was working on a problem. Uh, I was interested in studying uh, uh, storytelling uh, using AI, and uh, we were measuring some some behavior in books. And I had a question, a sort of statistical question. So I went to a statistics friend of mine and asked him how to potentially solve this. I went to an economist because it was a time series problem, and he gave me some suggestions. And then I spent an afternoon talking with uh, ChatGPT about how to do this. And you know, no shade on them, but you know, uh, after those couple hours, I was a lot further along in solving my problem than I was with the casual conversations with the experts. So it's not going to replace those experts for sure. If I had, you know, two full days of my economist's friend's time, 
uh, I would have much better understood the problem much more deeply, had a really interesting application. But uh, he doesn't have the time to do that, whereas Chappie GPT obviously has uh, unlimited amounts of time. So those kinds of scenarios, I think, are going to be really potentially interesting uh, for future applications. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I mean, we've been hearing a lot about AI and machine learning for you know, the last couple of decades. And, and the conversation has generally been very positive and optimistic and, and hopeful. And suddenly it's not. And I'm wondering, you know, in the last few weeks, you know, we've heard some very stark warnings now about how AI might be getting beyond our control or perhaps being used for nefarious purposes. And, and these warnings are often coming from some of the very creators and pioneers of the technology itself. So I guess my question is, what has changed in the last few weeks, in the last few months, um, that all of a sudden the conversation has gone from, you know, optimistic to caution and, and warning? Hmm. Uh, I can jump in. Yeah, go ahead, a, Professor Roots. Yeah, I can take a to pass pass at that. Um, I was actually we were I was I was discussing this just yesterday actually with a couple of colleagues of mine who are machine learning researchers, and um, one of the questions that I think uh, we often hear is um, the public didn't really feel like they saw this coming uh, when we talk about something like ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. What did what do machine learning folks think like? Like, did we see this coming? Why didn't we see this coming? And I think that the honest, the honest truth is that I don't think even folks in the machine learning space saw the dramatic improvements coming that we see with things like large language models. I mean, large language models have been around a long time. They've been around since uh, uh, mid, you know, 2015s. Um, and they've been steadily improving, but what has changed, what what uh, what created sort of this this massive, uh, seemingly magical shift, is the sheer size of the model that is being used. And and when when I say model, really, what you can think about is the amount of the amount of uh, memory that the machine is allowed to have. And what we did is we. Uh, OpenAI in particular sort of asked the question, well, what if we increase the amount of memory that that system has by tenfold compared to what had been done in, in research and labs before? And that seems to have created not 10 times more capability, but 100 times more capability. And I don't mm -hmm. think that anybody, even in the machine learning world, I don't think anybody could have predicted that. And so I think that that's that's the dynamic that is creating sort of the sense of, of to, to use uh, 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 Professor Piper's term, the uncertainty right now, which I think is creating a certain sense of disease, even among um, experts in, in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I have to say, it's not all, it's, as you said, it's not all negative. Uh, you know, it's, it's uncertainty. Um, I don't think that this by any stretch means that anybody's expecting these things to become sentient right away, but we're asking the questions, well, if we get an exponential increase in capability now, what does it mean when we uncover the next exponential bump that happens? Mm -hmm. So Professor, yeah, the, okay, go ahead. Yeah, please. yeah the, the only thing I'd add there is I, I'm, I'm starting to have concerns about the concerns. Um, in other words, you know, I think it's the point Derek makes is 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 very important. In other words, there was this sort of surprising takeoff effect um, with the recent scale increases of language models. I think for those of us who kind of you know, and Derek included, like to use these regularly, they're you know they're like okay, sure, <laughs> they're they're not they're not that overwhelming in their current state. And obviously, so what's happening is people are projecting forward. And the scenario, just so you know, viewers are, are aware of this scenario people are really worried about is when AIs get intelligent enough to, to build AIs, right? So it's that, mm -hmm. that self-programming moment that uh, I think really worries people because it's this, you know, the, the, the speed at which they work is, is so totally different than humans. And so their reproducibility and their ability to plug in the internet and kind of just like take off, right? That's the sci-fi uh, scenario that is now a, a realistic concern given their capacities. Um, but it's still very far in the future. It's very uncertain. And the the, the current capacities we have are, are very, very far from that. And so mm -hmm. I always just like, yes, it's something we need to keep in mind. Yes, it's something we need to be keeping an eye on. 
But when you see major players in this field who have very strong corporate interests in particular outcomes, engaging in this language, this sort of doom mm -hmm. or fear language, um, I have concerns that uh, the the sort of mm, the intent behind that discourse, if you will, I you know mm -hmm. my my concern is that this may be serving more narrow interests. This fear mongering may be serving more narrow interests than. Uh, you know, really worried about uh, citizenry. To use a very concrete example, um, we we deterministically know humanity faces an existential crisis if we continue on our current path of carbon emissions, um, and you know, th without doubt, um, that w w the actions we're undertaking and the discourse around that is probably even more muted compared to a really uncertain future around AI. And so when I see that discrepancy between known outcomes and the rhetoric around known outcomes, I get a little worried and start to think like, maybe someone's trying to sell me something, or maybe this may mm -hmm. serve their interest to kind of get us all worked up or fearful of this thing. So I, yeah. I do want listeners to also viewers to be like, aware that the current capacities of these things are it's not you know it's not how it's not going to take over the world tomorrow so we, we need to be a little cautious in how worked up we get if i can just jump in with one quick anecdote so in uh, uh on some of the technical uh, blogs and and podcasts uh that i follow sam altman uh who's the head of open ai which built chat gpt um uh, had a really great line, which which I really liked, which is he was sort of he was pressed on this point to like, how good is this really? And his comment was the uh, it's really impressive, but the longer you use it, the less impressive it gets. And <laughs> and I think that that's a pretty fair. I, I was I was really struck, actually, by sort of the honesty of that comment coming from somebody yeah. who I think really has the opportunity to ride the the, the hype bubble around this. But it's true. And as uh, like Andrew is, you know, as somebody who spends a lot of time with this, the more time you spend with it, the more you realize just how profoundly limited it is in a number of regards, particularly when you start thinking about some of these existential risks that people are talking about. Right. And there is a theory out there, and some would say a conspiracy theory, I don't know, that the tech industry itself is engaged, or the AI industry is engaged in this fear mongering in a way to build hype about the product because if they get us so scared about it we'll get so interested and want to sort of engage with it um so you know maybe there is a bit to that theory we'll we'll see but um so i, I do want to walk through some of the specific concerns that people have raised with regards to you know chat gpt and other ai tools and maybe ask each of you to to, to talk about them and, and you know maybe rate, weigh some of the risks you see associated with with the technology um, so, Professor Ruths, maybe I'll start with an obvious one when we think about tools that, as you've described for us so beautifully, you know, scrape the internet for pre-existing language, you know, and that's the issue around copyright and intellectual property. I mean, if the technology is so easy to use and, and essentially free, what guarantees do we have that people are creating original work and not just stealing the intellectual property of others? Um, well, I'll answer the question the way that you asked it first, and then I might take my own spin on it. Um, so, sure. it, you know, when you say, what are the guarantees? I, I think I would have to genuinely say there are no guarantees. Um, these machines are trained, uh, as I said, by looking at patterns. Um, we know uh, there's, there's strong evidence that a lot of the material that they produce may not be identical, but basically strongly reproducing patterns that it's been exposed to. Um, and so that means that un, uh, unfiltered, un, uh, unregulated, un, un sort of uh, edited, that a lot of that content could be uh, infringing on copyright, or at least maybe in, infringing on copyright, perhaps maybe too, too legal a spin on it, mm -hmm. reproducing work that it's already been exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think that there's sort of another question, though, which is how much of a problem is that? Uh, mm -hmm. Because it could either be a huge problem or it could be a, a, a non-issue non uh, if you consider that most of education um, consists of being exposed to material that already exists and then being asked to do things novel. So sort of we're always presented with the opportunity to... Uh, plagiarize to you know to breach copyright to pick up and, and use other people's ideas in irresponsible and unethical ways 
I think mm -hmm. that particularly at this moment, particularly before we've developed machinery to figure out how to, in an automated way, hold these machines accountable to, to not producing that kind of content. I do think that this the onus really falls on the users to be thoughtful consumers of the content that's that's produced. Um, if mm -hmm. we if we engage with this material, and I think this is where a lot of the education concerns are, if people engage with this material and literally copy and paste it and then submit, post, you know, use it that way, you know, that's that's there's no thoughtful engagement going on there. If you take a piece of content and use it like any other written piece of content we interact with as food for thought, as inspiration, as structural uh, brainstorm, then it could be actually a very valuable tool. And for me, that really starts to uh, uh, remove concerns about copyright. But of course, that's putting a lot of responsibility on us as the users. Right. No, so let me turn to you, Professor Piper, because this I think segues beautifully into my next line of questions or the next concern, which is around education and and essentially cheating and plagiarism in, in an academic setting. And I know that you, Professor Piper, have written quite a lot about the integration of chat GPT technology into the classroom and specifically into the courses you teach here at McGill. So I'm wondering, how are you as a professor who has to receive this work and grade this work, how are you wrestling with the issue and specifically, you know, do you allow students to use these tools when they're writing exams or submitting essays? And if you don't, how do you regulate against it? Yeah, so <laughs> that is a, it has turned out to be a gnarly can of worms that was uh, uh, served to us about two weeks before the start of the semester. So you can imagine uh, the challenge that I was facing as I started teaching in, in January. Um, I, you know, I think one, just to take a step back and also connect a little bit with what Derek was saying, I mean, what these systems are doing is asking hard questions of us to reflect on what does it mean to be creative? You know, what is what is creativity? And I think when we the the, the way we get into these issues, it, it's tricky. In other words, this is a very fuzzy concept. Um, and it's something that intellectual property law has you know tried to address for a very long time. And it has a lot of tendrils. It has a lot of dimensions. And I think this this is sort of the framing of the problem. In other words, where do my ideas begin and other people's end? Um, where does where am I adding my creativity as an individual creative human being? Um, and so that's a really hard question to answer. And so we're not going to we're not going to get out of this. There's not going to be a clear framework that makes these questions not be murky. Um, and the technology is just putting pressure um, on those questions, which is interesting in the same way that it's raising questions about you know, what does it mean to be conscious? What is consciousness? What is sentience? Right. All these kind of big questions. The AI is like putting right in front of us and saying, well, OK, what you know, what's special here mm -hmm. to your to your concrete question about the classroom? So, um, you know, I, I it, it was a real scramble to figure out, OK, here's a technology where somebody could potentially just hit a button and do an assignment. And, you know, and that is absolutely the last thing you want in education. So the, the things that I did this semester um, that I'm going to be thinking about as I go to my next uh, semester of teaching in the fall is number one, is I really wanted to make it present in the classroom. So there was suddenly this elephant in the room and I was not going to just ban it, hide it, pretend it didn't exist. I knew students were gonna be using it. I knew students were gonna be intrigued by it and I knew it may potentially be useful for them. And so when we talk about usefulness, we have to kind of be more concrete and, and figure out what ways it can help and what ways it's inhibiting their learning. And the problem is right now we just don't know. In other words, so you know, I wanted to talk about it. I use it in examples all the time in class. If I ask them a question and the discussion's kind of flat or it's not going anywhere and, and, and it's hard to figure out what's going on, I'll just ask the question to ChatGPT, ask it to give me an answer. <laughs> then we'll talk about its answer, which can be an interesting way to sort of turn people's critical minds, get their, their kind of critical faculties moving in class where they're thinking about somebody else's answer, even if it's a robot's answer. Um, so I do things like that. I had to reflect on my assignments. So every assignment I'd created, I would run through ChatGPT and see, you know, could it do a reasonable job answering this question? And if the answer is yes, and in many cases it is, it is yes, it's not going to be amazing, but for many, many types of assignments that we hand out at university, it'll, it'll get you some way there. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, you know, if you have a button to solve your homework, that's, that's a problem. 
And so what it meant was moving more writing assignments into the classroom, um, thinking about breaking writing down into steps where it's really more modular, the training that they're doing. So they're doing the brainstorming, they're doing the outlining, then they're doing the crafting. And then you can start to think about, okay, where is this tool useful? Right. And uh, again, this is, you know, we're still experimenting with this. Like, can it be helpful for brainstorming? Um, mm -hmm. and can it be helpful for the front and back end of the assignments where, you know, students often look at the blank page and they're like, you know, this is a big new topic. I don't have a lot of experience. I'm not quite sure what to say. Can you get the ball rolling? But then mm -hmm. how do you draw a boundary there and say, OK, I got the ball rolling, but now you need to write it. Um, conversely, on the back end, you've written something and, you know, you're still learning how to write. You're not an expert writer yet. No one's an expert writer really ever in their lives. Can this, you know, machinery help us help my prose sound better right, for a particular audience, especially if you're learning technical writing in a new discipline? Can it help with that? If you're a non-native mm -hmm. speaker, which is an, you know, not insignificant portion of our students, can it help you write better in English? Um, so these are very practical things that can be quite useful. But pinning the boundaries between when it's helping me do what I need to do better and when it's substituting itself for my learning, that, that's the boundary we're trying to figure out. And that's really unclear. Like, that's really mm -hmm. unclear. And so I, you know, when I'm in the classroom, I'm really just trying to figure out, okay, what can I give them where I'm really assured that they're, they're using their creative brains, they're using their critical thinking, and what spaces can this technology uh, sort of facilitate that process? And help them get further uh, with that assignment. Um, and uh, we're still probing that. Like I still, it's a big learning curve for us as educators. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thanks for that answer. So, Professor Ruth, maybe I'll bring you in on that question as well. I know mm -hmm. you had mentioned to me in an earlier conversation that I think you said that ChatGPT could pass your intro to the computer science course. You know, just as a robot. Um, so, I guess the question is, you know, I don't want to sound too provocative, but is that a problem? I mean, if, if students are using tools that exist out there, I mean, I know when I went to school, I don't remember ever being allowed to use calculators in, in our math classes, whereas today my kids mm -hmm. you know, went to school and they're told you can use your calculators. Why would we deprive you from a tool like a calculator that anyone can use? So yeah. when we think about now ChatGPT and the problem solving and the creativity piece, is it a problem if students are using a readily available tool to help them solve their problems and, and pass their courses? Well, I think it comes back to a point that, that Andrew just made, which is uh, where where is something like ChatGPT or a, the computer science equivalent, by the way, is called Copilot. So Copilot is a tool that uh, literally will write code into uh, code, code editors. Um, mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we have our own version of it that effectively can complete assignments straight, uh, straight away. I think the question is, where is ChatGPT or Copilot? Where is that helping? And where is that hindering skill development? And I think that there's mm -hmm. a there's an important nuance to sort of separate out, which which Andrew is getting at here, which is that this that question actually now exists in two ways that didn't before, which is there's the there's sort of the time time old educator question which is how do i help my student get the skill that i have in mind that they i want them to get i want them to learn how to write a particular algorithm i want them to know how to compose an essay of this sort i want i want them to critically analyze literature like what is the what is the skill we're after but we're also looking at now starting to think about sort of what are the skills that students now need to be equipped with um, and which skills are we maybe teaching them that are no longer going to be relevant? Mm -hmm. So if uh, with something like Copilot uh, and, and computer science, I think that we are experiencing this in a very profound way. Um, it, Copilot does a great job of writing very basic parts of programs now. And I have trouble imagining a future in which anybody's really going to need to write the basic parts of programs anymore. Um, mm -hmm. That used to be a skill that was pretty essential. That you know, that was a goal of the intro computer science course. So now that we've removed that, potentially removed that as a skill that a student needs to have, what does that mean about the skills that I, as an educator, am aspiring or aiming to provide them with? And mm -hmm. so there's sort of this. There's the, there are these parallel questions that are now being asked by educators, and we're being asked to sort of figure out that 
um, I don't think anybody has the answers to. There's how do you teach with ChatGPT, but then there's also what kind of future am I trying to prepare my students for? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that we're we're in a moment right now. I would say probably over the next one to I would venture to say one to three or four years. I think that's going to be a completely unknown question that maybe becomes more into focus. But I think as educators, we're going to have to figure out how much we respond to this idea that the future is going to be different versus the future is the same. We'll just assume that you need the same skills and we just need to make sure that ChatGPT fits into teaching those skills. But mm -hmm. I think that those are the, that's really the question. Those are the two questions that we're going to have to be tangling with as we design our curriculum. And I will, I'll echo Andrew's points, which is, I do not know. Um, it's, it is really uncertain territory. Um, I think for me, one of the thoughts that I, I think I would leave everybody with is, I think that what it does mean is that students are going to be asked to be more proactively engaged in their education than they have been before. Ooh. Because that we are, we have fewer tools to hold them accountable to the kind of education, educational activities that they need to be involved in in order to develop skills, because they can always turn back to these tools. And I think that that's mm -hmm. going to be a really interesting and challenging place for both students and educators to navigate as we move into this new period. Right, right, very interesting. So this has been a wonderful conversation so far. I have a bunch more questions. If anyone is watching live and has any questions for either Professor Piper or Professor Ruth, you can send them to us by email at aoc at mcgill.ca. Um, Professor Piper, I think you touched a little bit on some of the sort of philosophical concerns behind all of this sort of the backdrop. So I, I'd like to maybe you know, come back to that again. Um, and when we think about these tools like generative language tools and, and sort of how they create words and language and creative expression, I'm wondering what does this do for the devaluation of, of human labor and originality and creativity? And is, is, is there a concern that we might be living in a world of sameness and homogeneity in our language, our culture, our creative expression? And one concrete example that, that really struck me was the, the current Hollywood writer's strike that I think we've all heard about, um, you know, they're striking for more money, like, duh. But it's the other thing that they're really concerned about the writers is getting producers to agree to not use chatbots to create scripts, um, which I hadn't really thought about. But I'm wondering, is that a technology that's actually being used to develop scripts for TV shows and movies and lyrics for songs? And if this catches on as a new way of doing story creation, and we're relying on predictive language tools, does that mean that we've seen the last of plot twists and, and surprise endings and, and really a, a real sea change in how we think about cultural expression? Yeah, I, I was really surprised that that was one of the kind of pivot issues around that strike. Um, I, I hadn't, again, like so many of these issues, I hadn't seen that coming. Um, I was also mm -hmm. surprised just given my experience with the technology. In other words, uh, ChatGPT cannot write great poetry. It really can't write great stories from scratch. Um, and so again, you know, this like pr you know, probing it, spending time with it is really important to get a sense of its affordances. Now, when you talk about script doctoring, you know, can we can we improve on some text or do some edits uh, and not have to pay a writer, but we could have a bot do that? Maybe. Right. I, again, I, we, I don't have the experience yet in our lab. We haven't tried out these kind of experiments. It gives me lots of ideas of things we would like to do in our lab because, yeah, we'd <laughs> love to, to, to study AI and culture. Um, but I think it's really important to like th we're not at a state where the, the, the idea of human creativity has just like been replicated. Um, I, you know, and again, I think this is what it means to put pressure on what creativity is. For sure, there is a ton of rote material in screenplays, in novels. Uh, that's one of the kind of shocking and really continuously fascinating discoveries that we have in my lab, which is like just how predictable culture is. Um, when we write novels, when we make movies, when we write song lyrics, like we're really, as Derek was saying, like we're just drawing on this large archive of past patterns. And we want to assure our listeners that we're in this genre that we're, we're on the same page, so to speak. And so there's a lot of predictability to how culture mm -hmm. works. Um, and so 
the the promise of AI being able to replicate that is that yeah, they're like human creativity is often not that creative. Like it's it's not surprising <laughs> and it's rote, right? Pop lyrics that, that doesn't blow anybody's mind, but it still makes us feel good because it taps into these sort of deep pathways and grooves. So, you know, I think the 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 immediate concern of the idea of like people in creative industries are gonna be out of jobs, I I to me that feels overblown. I, I see this as really thinking about creative assistance. And I, and I think the framework for ChatGPT, the way they're training it, and this is a really important fact too, is people need to realize like, this is not just a language model trained on the internet as Derek was talking about, but it also has all these layers of reinforcement learning. So it's, it's learning to be an assistant. And that's a mm -hmm. big part of its identity as it interacts with you. So this idea of assistance seems kind of interesting to me because it's not, you know, you don't get, you don't press a button and get a, and get a novel or a great story like that. That we're just not there. Um, but maybe it can facilitate these sort of more modular aspects of creativity. You know, I, I, I want to think about creating an image in this style with this feature and this da 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 to go along with this book I'm writing, and I use it to generate some of the ideas. And then you're asking yourself, where is the human creativity beginning and ending, and where is the machine? participating in that. And I think it's that blending that is both interesting and complex. In other words, the fears of machines or something ruining human creativity, like that concern goes way back, right? As a, as a mm -hmm. historian of literature, I can give you so many examples where people, <laughs> moral panics around technology ruining art, right? Like that, that is as old mm -hmm. as time. Um, and what it does is each moment is it makes us reflect on where is our creativity located? And mm -hmm. can these tools help anybody create something? And if so, that's a boon, right? If you, if you put a tool mm -hmm. in everybody's hands that helps them suddenly think about, hey, I wanna write a children's book, or I wanna write a short story, or I wanna make uh, an image, and I wanna use these things to do it, or I wanna make a game, um, that's kind of exciting to me. Right. That actually is a tool that's helping people be more creative and not replacing their creativity. So, I, you know, I think we need to kind of keep our eye on both of these dimensions, the replacement quality, which I think really isn't there. And then there's the assistance quality, which could be very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Ruth, I, maybe we'll build on that point and we think about the, the, the replacement or the not replacing. When we think about the job market, you know, are you envisioning a future where, you know, the advent or, or sort of the growth of AI might potentially change or even obliterate certain jobs, certain professions. I mean, I'm thinking some of the obvious ones are things like you know, maybe a translator uh, or a grant writer uh, who's doing that sort of very predictive kind of writing. You know, but I've also you know seen and read cases about you know trial lawyers being mm -hmm. potentially replaced by by this kind of software, or uh, you know even psychologists. If you have a mm -hmm. sort of personal assistant therapist on, you know, on your phone, do you need to go see someone? So is it too soon or are we already starting to see some concerns around some, some professions that could be replaced by AI? Well, I, I think we're certainly seeing concerns. Um, in, this, in this space, I, I also agree very much with Andrew's point, which is I think that the concerns are being largely overblown. Um, that's not to say that there aren't going to be big changes in the workforce. I mean, with the advent of any uh, major advancement in technology, jobs change, the workforce changes, you know, we have to reskill and, and learn things. Um, I don't see any indication that sort of any, uh, any human job that involves a moderate level of creativity is going to complete, be completely obliterated. I do think that those are going to change though. Um, so, I mean, and, and, your, your opener for this, uh, for, for this podcast, I think, actually is a really good example of that, which is you can now leverage ChatGPT to do a portion of the kind of work that you might need to do. Um, and But that, that, to me, is more about what Andrew is discussing, which is this AI assistance. And, you know, we've had assistance, technology assistance forever. I mean, the calculator is a technology-aided assistant, uh, the... Um, you know, factory uh, forklifts are uh, technology-aided uh, equipment assistance. I mean, there are many, many forms of technology assistance. This is just going to be another one. Mm -hmm. What What is that going to do? Um, 
well, over time, it is going to probably have dramatic effects on what the specific job description is that perhaps any one of us is doing. But I think that right now, what rather than having a tremendous amount of concern about it, I think we should be approaching it with a almost a from a place of curiosity and experimentation, because these are tools that are now available. They're tools that are useful, and we should be in every one of our occupations. We should be looking for ways to responsibly use them in order to do our jobs better. Um, and mm -hmm. as long as we're approaching it from that perspective, I think that puts each person in a place to be part of the evolution of the workforce, to be part of the evolution of what a job means, of what being a communications uh, officer means, of what being a grant writer means, of what being a professor means. Like that is going to be a moving target. But my my certainly what I would like to leave everybody with is rather than be afraid, be curious and use it and look for ways to use it because that puts you in a place to be part of the process of figuring out how we adopt this rather than um, trying to shut it down and trying to sort of stay where we are in this moment, because that's not where we're going to be in five years. Right. right. Yeah. The, if, if I can just jump, uh, yeah, in, uh, in, yeah. you know, add a dimension to that is, and this is where it comes back to us as, as educators um, in the sense that, you know, and, and for those out there who have kids going to, to university or thinking about this, like, you should have the expectation that that students are getting exposed to this technology and how it impacts what, whatever they're studying, but also whatever careers or industries they're interested in going in. You know, take the example of lawyers like it, it's it's not going to replace lawyers, but it may be able to do things that lawyers do at a lower level. In other words, I often think about these as accessibility issues. It's very, you know, if you need some basic legal advice or some basic legal documentation, it's very expensive. You have to find the trouble of getting someone. What's their reliability? Um, maybe these tools make those kinds of services more widely accessible, again, with all sorts of quality control, you know, testing that needs to be done. Similarly with counseling, I mean, there it's, you know, extremely sensitive when you're talking about mental health. And so we want to be very cautious as we move forward in this. But access to mental health uh, counseling is extremely limited, extremely costly. It is a huge social problem. Um, and so if it's possible that technology can help make these kinds of services uh, that require expertise more accessible to more people, then that's a net, that's a net good, again, with all of the you know, safety concerns that we want to want to make sure about. But I, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, just want to underscore Derek's point about the the coverage on this is a lot is a is a, like a net zero. You know, what are we going to lose? And I really think we need to think about this idea of integration and adaptation, and also some of the potential social benefits if we can get the technology right. Right, right. Well, great answers, if, both. Yeah, go ahead. If Tom. I can, if I can actually just jump in on that and, and just add mm -hmm. one other sort of twist to it, I think that. Um, when we think about concerns, you, you know, uh, Andrew was, was highlighting some of these sort of, sort of within industry issues. So, you know, lawyers, lawyers are not going to uh, go away, but some potentially some of the most basic activities that they perform. I think that one of the things we do need to be thinking about and careful about uh, and aware of is that in many cases, that sort of those those most fundamental or basic activities are often performed as sort of entry level work. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about the kind of jobs that may undergo the most dramatic change, it may be those entry that sort of entry level work. And for instance, in computer science, to me, what that translates into is entry level programmers, entry level developer positions. And so as mm -hmm. I think about as I think about the skills that my students need to have when they graduate and enter the workforce, that's something that I'm very sensitive to. That's something I'm spending a lot of time thinking about, which is what, what are the skills that they need to have as the new kind of entry level position? What is going to be asked of them as they approach that? Because it's quite likely that the most basic activities will have been absorbed in some form by these assistants. But that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be entry level positions. It just means that they're going to be doing something different. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
we all need to be involved in thinking this through, but certainly as educators, I know Andrew and I are thinking about this a lot, which is what do we need to equip our, our students with to, for, to enter the workforce? But I think that that's for, for those listeners who are, uh, you know, who again have kids who are going to be going to university or who are managers <laughs> thinking about what entry level work means. Like we're all participating in this experiment trying to figure out mm -hmm. what that means. Right, right. Interesting. So I guess the bottom line, if I hear you correctly, is I will most likely still have a job tomorrow. Um, and maybe I'll get a raise for using ChatGPT to help make my work more effective. <laughs> Just make <laughs> sure you, you ask ChatGPT to help you write that letter asking for the <laughs> Wonderful. Great. So I do want to turn our attention to some of the questions that have come in. Again, if you're watching live and you do have a question for either of our guests, you can send it to us at aoc at mcgill.ca. Um, so we got the first one I'll look at here come, came to us from Charlotte Bichet. Um, this is a very interesting uh, issue that she brings up, which is the, the question of equity, diversity and inclusion um, or social justice perspectives in general and how we account for them in working with AI. Uh, she says, you know, she writes that we know that it, AI um, is not truly objective. Biases are often encoded into it by its creators. How do you actively and truly combat this? to ensure that racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, and other prejudices are not coded into programs. This is a, this yeah. is a huge problem. Okay, Andrew, go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, right. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it, is, it is front and center to, to those of us in the field. And uh, the, you know, I think the key is to think about it as a social, organizational, institutional problem and not just a technological problem. In other words, before we had these large language models, algorithms are being used in social settings for, for, for purposes, you know, recidivism prediction on uh, uh, around crime, um, job hiring, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there are biases built into these systems. There are biases built into any assessment system, right? If a bunch of humans get together and make a decision about hiring someone, they're there's they're bringing bias into that into that scenario. And so it's really, really important that we don't just sort of like outsource our judgments to technology and learn that that's a terrible idea. On the other hand, we can continually assess human performance, human plus algorithm performance, et cetera, so that we're aware of the kind of outcomes we want, the kind of society we want to live in, and then the kind of tools and decision-making procedures we're using to get there. And for sure, technology is part of that process from beginning to end, and that's been the case for a long time. And so we, it's really just about being self-conscious about like what are our, what are our goals, mm -hmm. and then not blindly trusting a technology that has not been well vetted, well assessed, well audited, right? That's, I think that's been one of the early uh, missteps that, that people have made in applying um, computational systems to social problems is there's not enough kind of safety testing. And, and when we think about safety with cars, we think about accidents and physical harm. What we're talking about with social problems is harms are about allocation. Who gets what? Who's considered for what? How are people represented in the media and these kinds of questions? And so we need, we need to like realign our understanding of this idea of harm away from technologies that can like physically hurt us like planes and trains to ones that can uh, hurt us in terms of resource allocation and representation and so mm -hmm. i think once we get more conscious around that we can be better stewards of the technology mm -hmm. okay great so here's uh we got uh, a couple of questions from katarina daniels uh around uh using these tools in an academic setting I'll get to the first one. So she says that at a recent conference, Professor Allery of U of T Law stated that when he allowed his students to use ChatGPT and other AI tools in his course, he found the top 10% stayed the same. The bottom 10% of the class disappeared into uh, a larger middle bunch. And he's wondering mm -hmm. if either of you have had similar experiences and why do you think the bottom of the class sort of disappeared or I guess was elevated into this this you know, I guess, median group. Um, well, maybe I'll, I'll take that first. Um, so the, as, uh, as I think you alluded to, so I looked at how well ChatGPT would do on uh, the homeworks in my intro to data science class. And what I determined is that it would pass, it would pass it, a low pass, but it would pass mm -hmm. it. Um, effectively, what that means is that 
that is that's already eliminating sort of that that bracket of students that might be struggling or or apathetic about their their grades in a class, um, allowing them to basically bump up into the passing space. Um, I think what what actually is happening is that there there's a couple different sort of um, archetypes for for students that that at least I see in class. There are uh, incredibly sort of motivated students who are going to aim to score as high as they can in a class. And then there are students that are um, that are going to score in sort of that mid range. Um, and then there's 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 students who may be struggling or uh, or who may not be engaged in the class. ChatGPT and these other technologies are simply allowing them to move straight into that sort of like that uh, that that average the 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 b c space mm -hmm. um and so i think that's that's really what's happening uh right now yeah and 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 i think what we want to figure out is we want the scenario where that bottom cohort that is struggling improves because they've their learning has improved and not because they figured out a, a shortcut. And it's probably the case that right now they're just figuring out a shortcut. That is to say they're, they're often struggling because they're just working less or mm -hmm. less attached to the material or have life circumstances that is making them hard to be engaged. Mm -hmm. So they've figured out sort of a cheat code. Um, and we, as educators, want to make sure that's not happening, but that the mm -hmm. bump up is actually because, well, we help the bottom cohort get better. That's great. Right. They, they, right. they, those who are struggling are struggling less. That's an improvement. But if it's just a short circuit, then that's we, we don't want that. And we have to figure out a way to assess that. Great. So we just have a few more minutes left. I'm getting a lot more questions. Um, here's a very quick one, which I, I meant to ask. It comes to us from Diana Ross. I know she's one of our frequent uh, viewers. Uh, I, probably not the Diana Ross, but a Diana Ross uh, who graduated from McGill. Thanks, Diana, for tuning in again. Very simple. She wants to know what does GPT stand for? Oh, it stands for generative pre-trained transformer. So it's uh, it is a it's basically a jumble of words that describes the very specific kind of artificial intelligence software, the technique that is used to build these models. Okay, well, thank you for that, and thank you, Diana, for uh, writing in with that question, which I should have asked, and um, for tuning in again. Uh, okay, so here are a couple more questions that, that I actually wanted to get to, and I'm glad that our, our, our viewers got, to, got there for us. This one came to us from Francine Lemire. Um, she's asking if one of you can comment on, um, the, well, she's calling the creative assistance AI can offer those with negative intentions to change the world order of democracy towards more of an autocracy or dictatorship. Who will be able to trust? And I had a whole line of questions around disinformation. I, I know we only have a few minutes left. If one of you wants to jump in with a quick uh, insight into AI and disinformation, political discourse. Yeah, I, I'll just answer that briefly. I mean, it's a huge problem. It's only going to get worse. Um, you know, we know misinformation predates language models. In other words, lots you, know, you can have farms of people writing crappy stuff and trying to flood spaces with this information that uh, disinformation is now cheaper and cheaper to produce because of AI. Um, and it just is going to make managing <clears throat> user generated content that much harder, which has been the backbone of the internet. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the two things to worry about there are really that question of validity. In other words, we're in a situation now where sort of everybody seems to believe everything they read, right? It's like a, a crazy, like the, the, the story space is so overpopulated. Um, when we're starting to see this idea of like deep fakes, right? We're starting to get intuitions about what it's like to simulate things with such high fidelity that appear to be real that aren't. We're gonna face that opposite problem, which is nobody believes anything. And mm. validating things that are true just consume so much time and energy. And so we have this really asymmetrical problem where the things that are valid and accurate are so small and hard to, to surface. And the things that are just junk are growing by the day. Mm -hmm. And regulating that is, a, is going to be a really massive social challenge. Right. And I we've have, seen it. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Well, I would, I would add to that that uh, I think, as Andrew said, is going to require a lot of time and energy. I've been reading some things recently that are, that are also talking about the emotional and mental strain, like the, the actual sort of health strain 
of doing that kind of parsing. And so when we talk about time and energy, it's not just about feeling tired at the end of the day, it's possibly also going to have very serious implications for like genuine sort of senses of mental well-being uh, and belonging in these spaces. So there, there really is a lot to be concerned about there. Right. And, and I think you talked about sort of the deep fakes. So it's one thing to, you know, put out content that makes fun of Joe Biden's age, for instance. But we've seen videos appear using AI where they've used Joe Biden's image and voice to, you know, tell people don't vote for me, I'm too old, that kind of thing. So I think the the possibilities for those who want to use this nefariously are, are quite, uh, quite unlimited. Um, I, let, let me get to this next question. Um, I was going to ask you both about government regulation and whether that's needed. We got a question from Angela Doyle. She says she's curious as to the accountability of who is feeding the information into these intelligent machines. So I guess the question is really about the accountability of those building the, the machines. And my question is about, is there a role for government to play in regulating the industry? And, and is there anything that's actually enforceable in this realm? Government, so I, I think that there definitely, as with any technology, powerful technology that comes out, there definitely will need to be uh, government regulation in some form and oversight uh, in order to ensure safety, uh, social well-being. Um, I think it is too early to know what that will look like. Uh, and part of that is that with these generative models, I think it's too early for the industry to even know what uh, it's what use cases of it are going to look like. One of the um, one of the uh, one of the trends that's happening right now that that I think is complicating this is we're seeing the rise of what are called open source large language models, which means that they're not even being built by software companies. They're not even built by companies and organizations at all. They're being built by open source communities. Um, which only complicates it because it's not even clear who needs to be regulated at that point. These things are just out there free floating, um, which is all to say regulation definitely needs to be put in place. We need to figure it out. We need to do so thoughtfully, um, but it is becoming an increasingly complicated question as to how that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add is I like to simplify the problem by thinking in terms of safety frameworks. You know, we we have really good systems for ensuring our planes are incredibly safe. You know, highway safety, maybe less so, but we, we have systems for this around cars and, and, and technologies that can be dangerous. Uh, you know, to me, AI is very similar. We just need to, to think our way into the safety frameworks of its application. So it's, you know, right now we're like, oh, maybe we shouldn't be doing this or maybe we shouldn't be touching it. And I think that's the wrong approach. I think it's really like, we're going to use it for X. Okay, what's dangerous about that? Who might be adversely affected? How? Test it. And before you apply it, you have to prove it's safe in the same way that, you know, you cannot send a plane with people on it in the air unless it's past safety protocols. Uh, so, I, you know, I find that a fairly intuitive and intelligible framework that is a very you know, at the point of application uh, regulatory problem. And, and we've got lots of precedent for that. So I don't think it's that hard to imagine our way into that. Right. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you both for that. Um, I have so many more questions I would love to ask. And uh, on that last point about political disinformation, we can probably do an entire webcast just on that topic. We may want to come back and re revisit that perhaps in the fall. Uh, but I do notice that we're just about out of time for, for today. Um, before we bring the webcast to a close, I'd like to remind uh, everyone watching that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may not have been able to tune in live. Of course, I'd like to extend my deepest gratitude to our two guests, Professors Andrew Piper and Derek Roots, for joining me today and providing such great insight and understanding into the challenges behind artificial intelligence. Uh, as we've discussed, it's a very complex topic, and I think you've both done a, an excellent job of outlining both the advantages and some of the dangers and concerns behind this technology and certainly given us a lot to think about over the coming weeks and months and, and years, I'm sure. Uh, those watching, thank you for tuning in and please continue to stay tuned to your McGill email and social media feeds over the coming weeks as we continue to share news about our exciting online and in-person programming. Until then, please be well and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>